Hello everyone, my name is Eddie Landeros and I am with MSJC's The Talon and I'm here with Nick Pettis, Dr. Michelle Weber, and Jesus Alcala Avalos. Um, and today we are going to talk about another serious subject uh, regarding diversity and regarding uh, the Asian hatred we have seen um, in the past uh, few weeks. And um, this really isn't nothing new, um, but in light of current events, we felt it was important to talk about this and discuss it openly. Um, so I'm going to start off with catching everybody up to speed. If you missed the news, um, I'm reading from the New York Times and their report on what happens um, in Atlanta. Um, so here we go. All right. So uh, last week, a 21-year-old white male uh, was arrested and charged with uh, fatal shootings that took place in Atlanta. Um, the man went on a rampage at three spas in the Atlanta area, killing eight people and was charged on Wednesday with eight counts of murder in connection with the attacks. The brazen shootings, which took the lives of six women of Asian descent, stirred considerable outrage and fear in the Asian American community. Investigators said they had not ruled out bias as a motivating factor, even as the suspect denied such racial animus once in custody. The suspect told the police that he had a sexual addiction and had carried out the shootings at the massage parlors to eliminate his temptation the authorities said on Wednesday. He also said that he had a frequented massage parlor. He had frequented massage parlors in the past and launched the attacks as a form of vengeance. All but one of the victims were women. The police said. So, seven Asian American women were killed in this shooting at three different locations. That's a serious problem. Um, on top of Asian American hatred. It was um, sexually uh, driven and also a problem with our gun control. Um, but we're going to focus on the um, Asian American and Pacific Islander hatred. So how do we feel about this? Uh, what was your reactions uh, to the, the news? Um, we'll start with you, Dr. Weber. My reaction what it was and, and always is when this happens is how have we come become so desensitized to human life? Um, and so that, that was sort of my gut reaction. And then as it started to unfold, that it was in fact massage parlors and the victims were primarily Asian American women, um, a couple of things hit me. The first is, that's not random, despite what the FBI says. Uh, even if the perpetrator says it's not a, it's not racially motivated, uh, it sounds to me like it is. Second, you cannot divorce this from sort of the hypersexualization of Asian American women that we have as a culture. Um, just in general, and so it's also a hate crime against women, in my mind, in that he was blaming females for his sexual problems or what he calls a sexual addiction, um, which is absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> um, and also just sort of the, the fact that this happens on the regular and we talk about it for a few days and then we move on and then it happens again. And that's just, that's sort of the gun uh, violence side of things. But given the amount of rhetoric that's been in the news, especially by even government officials, it's not that surprising that something would happen because it's been escalating over time. So those are my first thoughts. Right. Um, Nick, what about you? How did you feel about it? Okay, so when I was growing up, I had plenty of Asian American friends that I actually enjoyed being around. And when I heard that this happened, it just made my heart sink, literally sink. And it killed me to know that someone would do that and they could possibly hurt my friends. It's just, 
And the fact that he blamed the women for this, I'm, I'm literally infuriated. See, my hands are shaking with how angry I am at this. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of a weird um, way to excuse the violence. Um, it's just, it's very wrong. Um, and on top of that, um, to say that it's not attached to uh, racial bias or racial um, attempts of violence um, is so wrong because, I mean, in history, we've often seen um, Asian women uh, over sexualized or objectified in uh, that light, you know, when it comes to massage parlors, when it comes to salons, um, and just in general. Um, so to just uh, throw it to the wind like, oh, um, it was totally unrelated. Um, no, that's it's unbelievable. Um, Jesus, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, I always think it's, it's just such a sad thing because just like imagine going about your day like any other day, but then all of a sudden either your friend or even yourself or your family member or someone, someone important to you is just dead that day, just working. I'm just like, like, yeah, I, I mostly just, just feel like, feel sad because like that, that could just, that could be me. That could be anyone I know. All we're doing is going to our workplace or doing our daily errands, and then all of a sudden, someone's life is lost. But that's that's the first thing I always think of when I hear about these mass shootings. It's just like they they can they happen to they can happen to anyone, to the most innocent people, and then and they're that's it. They're gone forever. The next day, you have to learn to live without them. And uh, yeah, I also think uh, that Shooter is a scumbag for blaming others for his own issues and uh, deciding to take the lives of several people for an issue that he had with himself. And those are, and I and I hope he uh, is in jail for a long time so he can reflect on his actions. And I do not know if someone like that could get better, but I hope that they do get better. So such, uh, so they don't pursue such violent manners in the future. Uh, and then and then the last thing really is that uh, it's just a reminder to everyone that don't, don't hold uh, anger over petty things because you never know when, when the person that you, you have such a small spat with, they might not make it the next day, not through their own fault. Just some random person with anger issues decides to pick up a gun and, and kill you that day. And all of a sudden, all the, all the regrets you're going to have with someone else. So that's why I uh, appreciate the people you have right now because they can be doing the most mundane thing, doing the most routine uh, errand. And all of a sudden, you won't be able to say hello to them the next day. So uh, I try to keep that in mind. Whenever someone slights me in any way, I'm like, do I want to hold this anger against you for a long time? Because I don't know if the, if tomorrow I'll be able to say, oh, I'm sorry for yelling at you. Yeah, it's... it's um... It's very unfortunate, and I'm I'm happy that you uh, mentioned um, that you hope that he can do better. Um, it's hard to see that way, and it's hard to accept that. Um, and I don't know how many people will, but um, but we do need to progress and not treat hatred more hatred. Um, nevertheless, it's it's a tragedy. Um, and on top of that, um, I'm going to share the information as well that unfolded about uh, Captain Jay Baker, who was the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office spokesperson uh, for uh, the shooting. Um, he spoke about uh, the suspect, uh, Robert Aaron Long, and said that he had a ba bad day 
and uh, this is what he did. Um, Captain J. Baker himself also uh, has controversy on Facebook um, because he was inquiring about uh, promoting a t-shirt with um, the words coronavirus on it and the, the logo of uh, the Corona beer emblem. So, I mean, that right there shows his bias, shows his racism and uh, the lack of respect that he has um, for Asian Americans. Um, therefore, he has no place to say that. And that just go. it just shows um, the deep level um, that uh, this hatred and this racism, this prejudice goes into, um, especially when it comes to law enforcement, because it's not just Asian Americans, as we've seen in the past year, it's uh, black lives, it's uh, immigration and uh, Latinos, um, you know, extensive to ICE. So there's just this deep rooted problem uh, with people of color. Um, and it's, it's a real shame. I don't know if you saw any um, uh, Nick or Jesus in the news. This was just sort of adding insult to injury that there was actually a Hispanic gentleman who was in the room, the massage parlor next to his wife who was shot and killed. And they ended up detaining him in handcuffs for four hours. Wow. <laughs> while he was trying to get to her or find out what was going on simply because he thought have he because they thought he might have been involved somehow and that was he thought on the basis of the fact that he was hispanic and they didn't believe he could be married to a white woman um and so you want to talk about multiple layers of racism just be in this story alone um from every angle um it's frustrating it's sickening and sad uh, but that i can't even imagine your loved ones in the next room you can't get to them because they're detaining you because they think that you might be involved somehow exactly and it, it's it's just a real shame and we could go over this all night you know, but uh, a lot of the news has already covered this. And I really suggest that um, if you haven't seen these stories, please go check them out, uh, whether it's on YouTube or through verified news sites like uh, the New York Times, Associated Press. Um, but tonight, we kind of want to focus more on the history on how we got here um, and maybe what we can do better um, to uh, help support our fellow Asian American and Pacific Islander friends. Um, so I, I want to uh, give a little story about uh, my professor. So uh, if you don't know, I am MSJC alumni. I don't go to the school anymore. I uh, go to uh, Cal State Fullerton, um, but I still like to be involved with uh, MSJC because uh, it changed my life. It really did. Um, this past week, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, talk with my professor um, who is uh, who was born in China, and uh, he moved to America here. Um, so uh, he uh, teaches advertising. Uh, he's been heavily involved in his advertising career. Just brilliant work uh, with him. Um, and he was born in China, uh, and uh, worked hard to go to school. He was born in poverty, um, but ended up attending uh, Tsinghua University which uh, he states is the Harvard of China. And I looked it up and the, uh, in 2017, the enrollment rate for Beijing students admitted into Tsinghua and Peking is 0.91%. Um, it's very difficult to get into. There have been several uh, well-known people from China that have gotten into this university um, and it's a research university. So very well-educated, and he went on to go teach at uh, the University of Illinois, Emerson College, uh, now Cal State Fullerton. Um, he's been kind of everywhere. But when he moved to America, um, he landed in Chicago and it was difficult for him to get a job. He um, was going around doing his resume and he was trying to get involved in the work that he researched for because he studied for a long time. Uh, and everywhere he went, he was just turned down because he was Asian. And whenever he was accepted, um, people automatically assumed 
that he was a restaurant worker uh, because that was a common thing. So um, he says very difficult. You know, he came to America um, just like many other immigrants where uh, they hope for the American dream um, and they work hard to earn uh, the ability to succeed in their life because he, like I said, he came from poverty. Um, and despite those, uh, prejudice actions, despite, you know, what the stereotypes, um, were trying to shape him to be, he still succeeded in becoming a professor at different colleges, you know, and working past those, uh, options against him. Um, but his friends, his colleagues that were also Asian American um, and moved to the States um, did not succeed so well because of um, the research that they found, because of stereotypes uh, that were portrayed by them, ended up committing suicide, ended up facing um, severe hate crimes. Um, so I just wanted to share that because it really provides uh, a a great outlook of how our cultures or how immigrants um, can be just stereotyped right out of the gate. And it could just be like one single thing, you know? Um, and personally, I mean, like me or other Americans, um, we don't face those kind of criticisms, you know? Uh, me being Hispanic and Latino, uh, I'm very fortunate to not have. Um, those criticisms against me, you know, and I've been lighter skinned most of my life, but uh, my family members have been darker um, and they've faced criticism. Um, my colleagues and coworkers have faced criticism um, and I would get the backlash of that as well. But for some reason, um, they would treat me better because of my fair skin. And with Asians, that's kind of different. No matter what color skin they were, whether they're lighter or dark, they were always treated um, disrespectfully. Um, and when it comes to culture um, for Asians and for Hispanics, um, and I, I can't, I, I'm saying all this, but I really can't speak, but from what I know, what I've experienced, um, we're very passive when it comes to uh, racial discrimination, when it comes to those comments, um, because we feel it's best to just keep our head down and try and work towards uh, the main goal. And um, in, uh, when it comes to black lives, uh, they kind of get the full force of that because of the polar opposites um, that we've seen in American history. Uh, but nevertheless, um, when it becomes passive, it becomes easier to forget and uh, easier to ignore the problems that you see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, all the hate crimes that we see. Uh, so it's very important for us to have these discussions uh, and talk about it and support um, those cultures that uh, might be too, uh, might not have had the support in the past as it were, because it, it just builds up, you know, people act like this might just have come from nowhere, it might have just come from Trump's presidency with the coronavirus slander. While, and while that has exacerbated the problem, this has been a long time coming. You know, there have been these issues. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Weber, do you want to share any thoughts on this? Well, I was just going to say, um, most of us are too young to remember the Vietnam era very well, but that was not a well-liked war. That was a war that was very pr protested. And I think that, that Vietnamese and Asians in general got a lot of backlash from that. Um, whole situation in the 1960s and 70s. So you can think about that. Um, if you go back even further, we had Japanese internment camps as well. And I think that's something that isn't talked about enough. And it's not something that we bring to light very often. But um, Pearl Harbor was when the United States was bombed by the Japanese. And there are still some folks out there who are alive today who remember that very well and remember the resentment and the, the hatred that was aimed right at 
um, Japanese Americans during that time period, as, as well as what happened with the internment camps. Um, and those are just two examples, I'm not an expert on history, but um, we tend to sort of not necessarily remember those things because they weren't as prevalent or brought to the forefront and aren't as relevant uh, to us now. But um, I also think that a lot of times when we hear politicians talk about communists and communism, um, Chinese or China is brought up um, as a result of that. And when we have trade conflicts or we have um, people sort of bringing fear to the forefront, a lot of that gets thrust on the Asian American um, population as well. Uh, whether people know it or not, that's also a dynamic that's built sort of baked into it as well. So it isn't just coronavirus, it's something that's been ongoing um, throughout the course of uh, American history and, and even further back. But I think it's resurfaced quite a bit due to the rhetoric um, uh, in calling it the China virus, the Wuhan virus, and other things um, that sort of put a target on the back of the Asian American community. And let's go into that uh, with detail because I have some reports uh, from Stop AAPI Hate uh, that they posted on Instagram, um, just uh, some scenarios. Uh, so 21% uh, of reported incidents involve shunning or avoidance. So this happened to somebody, this is a quote. A uh, ride hailing service driver said to me after I got into his car, damn, another Asian riding with me today. I hope you don't have any COVID. He was leaning against the driver's door with his head tilted toward the window implying he doesn't want to be close to me while I sat diagonally behind him. When I told him, have a good day, he replied, you shouldn't be requesting any more rides. This was in Las Vegas, Nevada. 7% um, of reports, uh, reported incidents involved coughing or spitting. It's, I am a Pacific Islander. I was at the mall with a friend. I was wearing a plumeria clip and was speaking Chamorro when a woman coughed and said, you and your people are the reason why we have corona. She then said, go sail a boat back to your island. This was in Dallas, Texas. 3% of reported incidents involved refusal of service barring from an establishment. I was shouted at and harassed by workers as well as customers to get out of a store. They said, you Chinese bring the virus here and you dare ask people to keep social distance guidelines. This is in Cupertino, California. So how does that make you feel? You know, have you ever had to face situations like that or discrimination? Let's go with Nick. So as I covered in the last town talks, I have not been discriminated by my race, but because of my disability as Asperger syndrome, I don't believe I have been discriminated like that but I have seen it happen to someone I know. I'm not gonna say who they are to keep their confidentiality, but I have seen it happen before. What do you do in that situation? Like, what, what, what can you do? I know it's kind of difficult because you, like for me, I mean, sometimes you're just so appalled at what you hear. Um, so so what, do you, what did you do in that situation? So I literally got close to the person that said that and I was like you better help my friend or something won't or I just I'm sorry I'm so flustered I can't even speak right now but I told them either you help the both of us or we'll both leave and won't give you our business that's a good good answer yeah you need to support and um, yeah, if it's mean service, I mean, they have to know that the customer is always right. Um, Jesus, what about you? Have you ever seen incidents like this? Um, what have you done in these situations? Uh, I, no, I can't say that I have, um, but I have no idea how I would react in 
such a situation. Uh, I, like I, I would hope that I would be able to say something, but uh, there's there's always social pressure to not rock the boat, and uh, sometimes it's yeah. Sometimes, uh, like you said earlier, where sometimes we just uh, take it take it in stride, keep it quiet, like uh, just ignore the the all the the any like racial slurs just like try to ignore it keep your head down kind of thing that you said earlier so um like i said i haven't per- personally been attacked in such a way and i don't know how i would react dr Roper, how about you i have not but i have read a lot of literature on how to be an ally to someone who's in distress. And I guess in San Francisco, there's been a lot of attacks on elderly Asian American women primarily. Um, And so what is recommended that you do if you see something that that going on in which someone's being approached by a harasser is to walk up as if you're their friend and say something like, hey, it's been a long time since I've seen you. So good to see you. I can't believe um, I've run into you like this and just sort of strike up a conversation with them as if you know them. Typically, aggressors are intimidated by more people. Um, And you can also recruit people like, oh, hey, or my other friend over here, so and so, and and a lot of times people will play along just to because they see what's going on and they see um, that there is that power in numbers. So for for that kind of thing, um, that and and even just as a woman, that's something that we sort of do for each other um, too. So I think that that works in any type of allyship where you see someone being bullied is to just step in in a non-threatening way and sort of ward the other person off. Absolutely. And for me personally, uh, the the biggest uh, or the most common situation I always see, um, which can be very light um, if you don't even realize it, but is the accent um, or critically listening to what someone is saying. You know, for me, I'm a typical critical listener. And so no matter what um, accent or even like even if it's broken English, because I I only really understand English, um, but I'm going to try and hear you out because I understand how challenging it is for that person to uh, try and formulate a sentence. It's like, I mean, if you've ever tried to speak a foreign language um, to someone else to get your point across, it's difficult. You know, it's it can be frustrating, but. But nevertheless, I mean, you do what you can to uh, make the situation better. But the most common thing I saw with Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders is the accent gets in the way. And a lot of uh, people who are more entitled um, get frustrated, easily frustrated. Like, why don't you speak proper English? You know, you should know English when you come here. Um, Or situations with uh, people eating cat food. you know, or that cat food is made out of um, certain things. Like that's, you know, it, it really just pains me to hear all of that. Um, and what I do to step up to that is just like, um, you know, I try to keep the peace, but ultimately it is a matter of calling it out. It's like, no, I mean, if you're not going to be helpful, you need to just be quiet right now because I'm trying to make the situation better, you know, and that's what I learned a lot with security forces with de-escalating the situation and just making sure that we're on the same page because communication is key when it comes to these situations. Um, so yeah. Um, so lesson from that is, um, you know, like Nick, Jesus and Dr. Weber were saying, um, being united and standing strong with others, um, goes a long way you know if you think you're scared or too afraid to stand up for somebody else uh, imagine being that person Um, they are the most scared out of this scenario and when they feel like there's no help involved when you see your fellow asian american friends or pacific islander friends um, trying to uh, stop this hatred and violence against them protesting and posting stuff on social media 
and there's no one else around them posting that content and posting, uh, resharing their stories, um, you get so much more lonely. You're so lonely. Um, and you really start to see who you can trust in the society. So please, if you do care, um, support your friends, support Americans, because we all share uh, this nation. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Dr. Weber. So, and that leads me to sort of what MSJC is doing um, as far as being an ally for AAPI um, folks. And uh, Dr. Schultz released a statement that says that Mount San Jacinto urges everyone to support and protect Americans of Chinese, Asian, or Pacific Islander descent, or those who are perceived to be of Chinese, Asian, or Pacific Islander descent. The community has experienced a rise in physical violence, bullying, harassment, and stereotyping since the pandemic began. On Tuesday, March 16th, an unspeakable shooting in Atlanta was reported that killed eight people, six of them of Asian descent. We fully acknowledge the impact this act of hate has and violence has had on the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Our students and faculty join us as we vow to go beyond rewards and show your support in a visible way. This is the moment to call these events and behaviors what they are, racism. Violence and racist action against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders must stop, and we at MSJC can be part of the solution. This is the moment to consider recommitting your support of the MSJC equity pledge. Help us continue to create an institutional environment that vows to eradicate racism, hate, discrimination, particularly for our AAPI brothers and sisters. This is the moment to learn more about this community, do research, and by watching documentaries or reading literature about their experience in the politics of racism. Um, through these various actions, let us show our Asian American and Pacific Islander community that we are committed to eradicating systemic racism. And we, all of us at MSJC, are rallying to support employees and students who have experienced trauma from this event. Um, and it goes on, and you can read that on the website. But it basically says that we will not tolerate any of this on our campus because we are an anti-racist institution. Um, so I think that's notable. I think it's important. I think it's really great to hear that, that our institution is standing firm and being anti-racist and supporting the AAPI community. Absolutely. And uh, on the subject of books, because you mentioned uh, read, uh, Asian literature, Asian American literature, uh, to see that perspective. Uh, I have two book recommendations. Um, and I know as college students, you know, textbooks or reading might be a bore. Um, so these books are actually graphic novels and they're very uh, well illustrated. The stories are well told. Um, and it, it really, uh, I've read one of them already. The first one is, uh, they called us Enemy and that's by George Takei. Uh, George Takei was a lead role in Star Trek. He is also a um, very big activist, uh, a member of the LGBTQ community. He's Japanese American, um, and he actually was in uh, the Japanese internment camps. Um, uh, and this story, they call this enemy, uh, shows uh, his journey um, through those internment camps as well as the thoughts of his family and um, uh, politics and stuff. It's, it's a really neat look. I highly recommend you suggest it. It's a very quick read um, and it's worth reading over and over and again. Uh, the second book recommendation I have is American Born Chinese. Uh, this is by Jean Luen Yang. Luen Yang. Um, and this is about uh, being Chinese American um, living in the world. Again, it's a powerful story uh, from what I've heard. Uh, this is on my to-do list to read um, and I hope I hope to get the most out of it. Um, so please check those out. Um, the final thing I will say on this is um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see I have some Asian decorations in my background. Um, I've been heavily influenced by Asian culture, um, both in the uh, decoration sense and also in the family sense. You know, I grew up as a Hispanic American, um, but 
I never was really accepted, I, I, you know, and I hate to say that, but I was never really accepted by the Hispanic community, um, the white community or the black community. Um, but the majority of people I hung out with were Asian, uh, Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, um, Pacific Islander. It really, uh, that's where my culture lied, you know, and um, I grew up with a lot of stuff that came from Asia, you know, with video games, PlayStation, Nintendo, um, comic books, shows I watch with anime. And although I grew up with those, and although I know that's not what describes Asia, I hung out with friends and family members that took me in and showed me that we're all just people, you know, that's not attached to one culture or another. Um, it's a matter of respecting that and treating people like human beings. So, you know, when I have these on my wall, when I uh, think about the influences in my life that were Asian American or Asian, I can't help but be saddened and motivated to do better by AAPI. So if you are involved in any of these cultures, whether it be um, video games or anything like take a look at where your media comes from where your passions come from and respect that culture get to know that perspective a little bit more now don't just treat it on the surface and that really goes a long way because you become more passionate and you care so much more about those cultures around you so those are my final thoughts anyone else would like to share before we go Uh, I guess I'd like to talk a bit more about the remedy part. Um, as as earlier we said, uh, like defeating bullies, is, it just takes an eyeliner or two. And um, I'd like I just want to emphasize that that these uh, that a lot of times we just a uh, watch on the on the bystands. And when I was a kid, I did that too. Like why, like why would I hop in to uh, help out when I was being bullied? And yes, well, uh, earlier I said I didn't really see much of the racial discrimination part, but I did see bullying, and I was always, I was always, uh, I always thought of it as an other kind of problem, like how oh, that bullying is someone else's problem. But it it really is uh, that mindset that lets this stuff go on, because. Um, if because uh, as you said, imagine if that person being bullied was was you, like wouldn't you want someone to step in? And so uh, I I just want to emphasize the point that there's way less bullies or negative people than there are that uh, allies. And if they just if the allies just showed up, that they just said, hey, I'm willing to be here for you. What bully would stand up against that? So if you if you do see it happening, I do recommend uh, to stand up because uh, while you may just be one person, you could easily grab a group of people or form a group just by saying that I, I'm willing to be your ally for just this one moment, and you'll see that that bully, that aggressor, they they won't be able to stand up against that. Yeah. Absolutely, Jesus. Thank you for sharing. Go ahead, Nick. I just want to say I completely agree with Jesus, and I just want to add on a little bit to that. If you see something or hear something, tell somebody. You can get help from anyone, whether that be a family member or a teacher, or professor, or a cop even and get some help also don't bully i was bullied practically my entire life because i was different so i know how that feels so just don't do it and i want to thank dr schultz and msjc for installing this plan to end violence I mean, and racism on our campus, because 
racism is not a good thing and it's breaking up a lot of friendships and families and just end the racism now while you can. Thank you, Nick. That was super powerful. Stop the hate, I think, is important. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is is the concept of holding space. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, but it's just basically being there for your um, students, uh, classmates, family, friends who may be experiencing a hard time while this is going on and listen to them, let them vent. You don't have to fix it. There's no way that we'll all fix this overnight. But I think that there is a lot of power in letting the AAPI community know that their voice is heard, that it's not them just speaking and not being heard. And so that concept of holding space is just being there, letting those in, around you know that you're there, that if they need something, they can come to you. If they want to vent, they can vent. Um, and I, th I think it's really surprising what a long way that empathy goes towards helping folks heal. Yeah, it does go a long way. All right. Well, thank you all for being here to discuss this. Um, everyone watching, thank you for watching. I hope that we provided some context for you. Uh, please go check out those recommendations, the book recommendations. We'll also have some links for you to support in the YouTube description below. Um, so please check those out. And again, we can't stress enough. Just be out there, be active, uh, be vocal about this injustice. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to sign off. Um, I'm Eddie Landeros. We have Nick Pettis, Dr. Michelle Weber. This is Akala Avalos, um, and this is the Talon. Stop AAPI hate. See you.